Let's look at attention from the top. It's part of consciousness. And in traditional oriental medicine, they looked at the sequence of consciousness. And uh, it, it applies today, gives us insight. But we start with the metal element, which is the lungs, the large intestine, the breath. If you're aware of tra traditional Chinese medicine, you'd be aware of those, but also the, s the senses. It's where we take in, like taking in the breath, we take in light, sound, taste, smell, feeling, touch, the internal feeling, like emotion. So our awareness of energy and movement patterns. So <clears throat> awareness is on this metal element level, the first level <clears throat> of consciousness is our ability to simultaneously contemplate, be aware, be present with all of these different modalities, different channels, different types of information. And that takes relaxation. That takes being in a space of coherence you know, because coherence is the fundamental ground of consciousness, it's the fundamental ground of life, of health. It's the, uh, the opposite of entropy, is syntropy, and that's what living beings are, where we're organized and we maintain, this is a flow form, and yet we maintain that flow form and actually grow it, where, where uh, entropy, the, the nature of the non-living aspect of the, the environment, of the, the living universe is this tendency to to break down, to uh, become more random. So we, we become more organized and we build up, build up not only the biological entity in this life, but the consciousness, the, con the spirit body, the conscious body that maintains its integrity infinitely, indefinitely. It's the immortal body. And this the physics of that are the <clears throat> The Jing, the, the the spirit essence of Oriental medicine, uh, and and also from Western medicine, the Bose Einstein condensate. The condensates are <clears throat> minerals that and, and electrons and photons even that are in a state of coherence with each other and therefore not not quantized, not working separately as independent entities, but organized and structured as a whole that allows higher degrees of functioning like consciousness. So consci consciousness fundamentally, if you think of our senses, it's the ability to be present in another place and or another time. Memory is our presence, the presence of the past here and now, our ability to be present mentally with that past experience. Uh, visions from the future, similar. We're present in the future through receiving those visions. And our normal senses of the environment are our presence at another location, even if it's that our head is aware of our toes, <laughs> or certainly our vision, in our vision, we're aware of the stars. We can hear things that are thousands of miles away sometimes, but we can see what's billions of light years away. So. Our senses are, are a function of non-locality, as it's called in physics, which I would call trans-locality, is trans-dimensional locality. What shows up as non-locality when you're trying to control something in a, in a physics uh, experiment, it's non-local because it's outside your lab. It's outside the, the field of view of your experiment. It's outside of your control. Therefore, it's considered to be mathematically rendered as a a probability field, but in fact, it's a causal field. It's not a probability field. The probability is that it's actually somewhere. You just don't know which place. So you call it a, a field and you call it a, a, a probability function. But uh, the actuality of, of our senses is we know actually from quantum physics experiments that when we do remote viewing and our mind is able to see beyond the curvature of the Earth, in through solid objects, which aren't solid because it's all space in between the, the things, that inside those things aren't things at all, it's but more space, and energy, 
flow patterns. Uh, <clears throat> there's quantum energy effects. We affect that distant place that we think of. In the same with remote healing studies, that when I project my thoughts for healing at a distant location, when there is actually measurable healing to humans, plants, or animals in that location, there's also measurable field effects in the energy field of that place. So there's a wormhole effect because it doesn't happen through through forward time. Uh, what we can control in an experiment is the forward time of electromagnetic field propagation, but we know there's more than that already in, in standard physics because there's non-locality. There's the fact that, that the, the entanglement between two quantum objects, when they're, even though they're separated, when one changes, the other changes, not by propagation of a speed of light wave form communicating that difference, but simultaneously. So which means that relativity is not true for that simultaneity. Relativity is about the forward progression of electromagnetism through space-time and, and how that might work. But that's about how we see the past. That's about perception. So this is actually how Einstein started thinking about it. He said, I'm going to do a thought experiment because I can't travel on a light wave. But you know what? My mind can. And that was the error he made was thinking, well, what if my body travels on a light wave? Then, then how, how would I perceive through these senses? No, we can travel on a light wave with the mind, it does it all the time, and there's no time for light traveling. There's, and so that's true, but we can't take our body and put it on the light wave. In order to give it enough energy to travel at the speed of light, we'd ionize the body and we'd be a plasma. We wouldn't be a human being. We'd be a cloud of, of plasmons, and, and, and a clock traveling on that light wave similarly would be. You know, there's different kinds of clocks. There's atomic clocks, and there's pendulum clocks, and they actually are affected differently when you move them in a gravitational field. So the whole idea of, of, of relativity is beautiful, brilliant mathematics, and it's not true of the entirety of existence. It's true only in, in its own perspective, which is why it's actually at odds with quantum, the quantum perspective. When, when the quantum physicists look at the quantum world, they say, well, here's how that works. And you're saying, here's how the cosmos works, assuming that gravitation, assuming, assuming that gravitation is the dominant force out there, which uh, it's not. <laughs> but if we assume it is, then, then we have this perspective of how we see things, which is from the past. Light coming to us is always from the past. And how we see the world, how we hear the world, there's waveforms coming to us from the past. But that's not the only way the universe works. It works in real time. We know that now. It's, uh, they say they've ruled out all of the possible effects, and they've really now 100% documented that, uh, that this, this quantum entanglement effect is in absolute real time. It's, not, it's faster than the speed of light. It's in real time. And we know that there's effects from the future. How do we know that? Even from quantum physics, effects from the future, it, one of the there's several possible interpretations of sub, of subatomic quantum world, and and one of them is that there's a negotiation between the, the past and the future. That that the way photons act when you give them a a, a, tr a pathway that, that limits their possibilities, that they start acting how they're going to need to act later in order to get through that path. They know the future already. So the future already exists, just like the past still exists in the present. In fact, the Russians did wonderful experiments. They, they called it torsion physics. And they were able to detect that there's this presence. Like, if we look at the sun, we see the sun where it was when that light that we see left the sun, which was about eight minutes ago. So we see the sun in its past location. We're seeing the past. We're perceiving the past. But they were able to also measure an image of the sun where the sun actually is now. And that would be a quantum entanglement position where the sun actually is now. That the matter here now knows where that position is. And they were also able to measure a third position, get a third image of the sun in the position where it will be in eight minutes. So, and, and our consciousness can transcend, those are the three fundamental 
dimensions of time, the past, present, and future. They are all, are all real, they all exist, and everything that we see, hear, and feel with our external senses is from the past. But what we see, hear, and feel internally is also blended and incorporated and infused with the future, our intuitions and, and visions, our dreams, our hopes, our imaginations, our creativity, all about the future, and, and also our memories about the past. So, in fact, we don't even see the, what's coming to us from the past out here in our, in our normal senses. We don't see it, attend to it, interpret it until it's already been affected by what we are looking for and what we have seen in the past. So what we actually see is a blend of past, present, and future. So back to the big picture, we need, if we're going to solve issues of attention, we need to have the whole, the whole field working. We need to be present in the whole field. We need to have that state of relaxation, that state of coherence, where the breath cycle is about 10 seconds, five seconds inhale, and five seconds exhale. That's a relaxed state of breath. If you see a deer that's afraid, that senses a predator, freezes, the breath becomes shallow. We do that too. Myopia is associated with that shallow breath. We're seeing lots and lots more myopia in, in, in advanced cultures where we keep the children indoors and say, uh, we're going to not have recess anymore. <laughs> and we'll just keep the kids inside. And <clears throat> so there's lots and lots more myopia. There's this shallow breathing that happens when there's a state of fear associated with the kidneys in oriental medicine and the, the autonomic nervous system, the adrenals associated with the kidneys are stressed and our sympathetic nervous system is activated and we can't digest well. and We become victims of ourselves, of our culture. We go into stress. We become victims of the, the food in the culture. Sugar is the highest association with myopia. You know, you go into a culture where there's no refined sugar and there's almost no myopia. And, and the culture goes along with the food and the culturally imposed uh, indoor classroom and, and tasks of, of near point vision, reading and writing and all that. So it's, 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 uh, you, you can't tease apart all of the causes in, in a laboratory sense of conventional science wanting to say, oh, where's the proof for that? You know, how long was it before there was enough proof that, 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 can, that cancer of the lung was, was contributed to by smoking? When I was a child, doctors were still telling patients, oh, you should smoke, it's relieved stress, because that's what was promoted. That was the people looking at the money. Hey, we can make money on this. We can make them more addictive by adding sugar. We can make them more addictive by adding 30 chemicals. And that makes more money. And that's all that was done in, in, in the commercial world. We need to turn that around and create as our value, which is the, the next step uh, of consciousness after attention. We start with awareness. We need the full awareness. We need to remove the toxins, remove the nutrient deficiencies, supply the food that's nutrient-rich in a healthful, natural environment so we can have this open, open space of consciousness inside and out that becomes integrated through experience in the world and, and learn to attend, learn to focus our attention within that in context, not out of context. When we focus hard, when we say, try harder, we lose context. How, do you, have you ever heard, heard of a child blanking out on tests? Blanking out, it's a common phenomenon. It's like, I studied it, I know it, uh, but I couldn't remember it on the test. I blanked out. What is that? Because the field of awareness shut down to where the memory was no longer present. We have something called state-dependent memory, state-dependent abilities in consciousness and brain function. When that state becomes more stressed than how we studied it, we can't remember. If we become less stressed than how we learned something even, we can lose that ability. People who who drink and play pool, and then they try to play pool sober, it's like, oh, I can't play unless I'm drinking. Because you've learned, you've coordinated the nerve cells to work together in that particular state of alcohol, which is the fastest burning sugar, a non-nutrient, an anti-nutrient, but yet you've learned it. It's a splinter skill. It's, it's a skill you've learned in that one state. We need to learn real life skills 
in, in a broad range of states, not just sit in that seat and look in this direction. Okay, now I can, maybe I'll remember that if I'm sitting in that seat looking in that direction, but what if I go home and I'm sitting in a different seat or I, you know, I'm in a different light environment or I'm, uh, if I you know, don't have hypoglycemia or I do have hypoglycemia, all these things affect the memory and the consciousness. So, so we need that stability of the field, the whole field, in order to be able to lightly direct our attention to the center or divide the attention between the center and thinking about that movement over here. Oh, it's just the child next to me coughing, sneezing, moving. Oh, it's just uh, uh, trees blowing in the wind. I can hear it. I can move, see, this, see the movement in my periphery. I don't have to move my eyes and be uh, ADHD. Hyper, I'm hyperactive. Why? Because because I'm seeing the world through a tunnel vision. And so I have to, have to look at everything. And, and because my vision is so suppressed, I have to touch it. And developmentally, that's a more primitive system. We have to put it in our mouth. We have to touch it. We have to feel it. When, our, when we develop the senses and they coordinate together, now I can look at that thing and I can imagine what it feels like. I don't have to touch it. So, so you know, rather than penalizing children for the stress state that we've put them under, we need to expand their abilities, their range of experience, their ability to be uh, relaxed and centered in their body, breathing once every 10 seconds. And if you breathe close to that rate, your body will automatically go into that state of coherence. Same with the heart. When you do that, now the heart, which is the fire element, the second element in consciousness development, uh, also goes into a state of coherence at about one cycle per second. And the heart is the, where the lung is, is the non-local part, which I would call trans-dimensional part. It brings the senses, sensory information from out there to here, and we project it back out there and, and have a match with the world that's veridical or true so that we can actually operate efficiently in the world. Uh, the, the heart is, is the integrator. It, it's, it's also trans-dimensional in a sense of self to self where the, the, the lung, the, the senses, are from non-self or from the field to, that's non-quantized. It's not, it's not an other, it's just not self, it's, it's the field. The field becomes self when it's in our awareness. We see it, I see it, it's part of me. Whatever I see is me, I'm seeing. It's my vision, my vision, my image, my, how I see the world. It's my hearing, it's my awareness, I feel my feet. I can feel my feet against the rung of the chair. And I can hear the airplane way out there in that direction. I can hear the direction because I have two ears, binaural localization and visual localization. If I look and see, turn my head and my neck and my eyes, and I see it, I can localize it more precisely because the vision is finer tuned. It gives us so much more information. It's our dominant sense. If I was a dog, I'd smell it. So I'd smell it. Oh. I smell it. It was not too long ago. I went over there. That smells interesting. <laughs> I'm going to check it out. <laughs> right? But we're dominantly visual. We're navigational beings. We navigate the, the, the celestial heavens. We're designed for that. We can see. The, the, how did people get to Hawaii? They were navigators. They read the stars. And, and we can fly. When we leave these bodies, we can fly. If we are, create the superconductivity, the lightness of being, if we attach ourselves not to the heaviness of what we perceive as material nature, but to the lightness of and spaciousness and expansiveness of the heavens and of spirit and of consciousness, and we can fly. The, the Sinoi tribe emphasized flying in their dreams, and it was one of the achievements that you know, we would want to achieve in your consciousness and spiritual development was to be able to fly in your dreams. So I encourage you to intend that. If you intend that, visualize it, rehearse it right before you go to bed. You may find that you start flying in your dreams. And it's, it's a real ability of the spirit body to, independent of your spirit body, when you're dreaming, there's, there's a shutoff valve in the nervous system, so you're not really connected to the muscles and the peripheral nerves. But your spirit body still has this ability to navigate that you can develop. Uh, and so we're self-regulating beings. So we need to develop that ability to self-regulate 
And we do that through developing coherence, which is like cohesion and, and teamwork within the body, where all the systems are working at the same time in an integrated way, rather than independent, sequential, isolated. You know, a cancer cell is a cell that's isolated by its senses from the rest of the body. It can't see, it's in darkness. It can't see the rest of the body. Literally, you look at a tumor, it's dark. The light can't get through. It's loaded with proteins that are blocking the connective tissue that's the channel for nourishing and detoxifying those cells. So we have to remove the toxins, remove the darkness, remove the layers of interference, get the senses working, get our awareness working, learn to attend gently within that field. But it's, it's the interplay of awareness with attention that is the solution to attention deficit. It's not more attention on the one thing that you're supposed to do. Get that right next time. Try harder. Practice more. No. Become more of who you are, which is our future self, which is present in the now, if we open to it. If we close, we close to the past even. I blanked out on the test. Oh, I couldn't remember anything. Ah, I failed, even though I knew it. I know it, but I didn't know it at that moment. I, I lost my wormhole to that experience of my past. I was disconnected from myself, my connection to myself over time. So, so if we go to the fire element, the, the, the heart, uh, and, and small intestine, and, and endocrine system, and circulation, these are all part of the fire element, but we're gonna look at the heart chakra as the, the core, core means heart, center of the, conscious, the, the consciousness of the being. So the energy comes in from the senses to that center and then integrates, they integrate through the functions of the heart, which is where the Shen resides, the spirit in, in, in uh, Oriental medicine, resides in the heart. It, it starts in, in, in the lungs with the breath and, and, it, and it's completed in the wood element, the liver, uh, in, in its highest form, and it's also, it resides in the heart. Because why? The spirit is everywhere. It is integrated. It's the function of the heart to integrate. So we're not talking about the highest function of it yet, but we're talking about the integrative, the beginnings, integrative function of the Shen, the spirit in the heart. And so that integration of figure and ground, centering and peripheral awareness, is, is a key thing to practice in any vision uh, or, or uh, sensory motor cognitive development program, which means life. Uh, in vision therapy programs, they've found that, that in conventional programs that look at the body as being made up of muscles and nerves and we're trying to strengthen this muscle to get the eyes to be more coordinated and aligned in this position, it's all materialistic in thinking. Those materialistic-based programs actually reduce peripheral vision. They improve central visual skills, but they're not, they're not generalized to you know, playing sports on the ball field because it's all sitting down with paper and pencil on a computer screen. And